Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show featuring another really fascinating guest who is helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people around the globe. We have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist. She serves as the technical lead for the COVID-19 response at the World Health Organization, where she develops guidance, training programs, information products uh, for the continuously evolving state of that pandemic, as well as serving uh, as the Emerging Diseases and Zoonosis Unit Head. Uh, Dr. Koker began her uh, journey in global health uh, with her interest in viruses and how they infect both animals and humans humans. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree in biological sciences from Cornell, her master's in epidemiology from Stanford, her PhD in infectious disease epidemiology from the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Medicine, where she authored her PhD on uh, pathogenic avian influenza H5N1. Um, following her PhD, she was a postdoc researcher at the World Health Organization, and she was acting as the liaison uh, for the Imperial College London Medical Research Center, Council Center for Outbreak Analyses, and she's been continuing to work with the WHO and prior to COVID-19 was serving as the uh, uh, the MERS Cove uh, technical lead in addition to being the unit head for the Emerging Disease Unit uh, and our focus in these areas uh, includes developing prevention and control programs for high threat respiratory pathogens uh, and if you've watched TV over the last few years, you have undoubtedly seen uh, her giving daily briefings uh, along with uh, WHO Director General uh, Dr. Gabrias, Gabriasis. Um, we're honored to have her with us. Uh, Dr. Van Kirkup, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show today. My goodness, what an introduction. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's really great to have you. I I, um, I very much enjoyed sort of reading through your your extensive uh, literature and, and the peer reviewed materials, and you know it's fascinating because uh, you know you spent a lot of time sort of quote in the field uh, during your early career. But I, I was I was struck by the fact that your original original field work um, had nothing to do with epidemiology, but had to do with another area which. I'm very, personally very passionate about, namely a medicinal botany, or I learned it as pharmacognosy back in yeah. school. Talk zoo pharmacognosy. Zoo pharmacognosy. Zoo pharmacognosy, yeah. Exactly. Could you talk a little bit about how you uh, ended up in places like Venezuela and Costa Rica, not just studying how indigenous peoples use plants for medicinal purposes, but how animals use them as well? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it... I've always been interested in science. Um, and when I was doing my undergraduate degree at Cornell University, I started off, um, my, my original uh, major was entomology, um, which I quickly switched. Uh, and then I went the pre-med route. Uh, and then, you know, but as I was there, I just, I just love science. Like I've always loved science. Um, and the courses there are really fantastic. I had some really great professors while I was there. Um, and I ended up working with a professor named Eloy Rodriguez. Professor Eloy Rodriguez, um, who worked with medicinal plants. Um, and, and he and others coined this term of zoo pharmacognosy. And, and it was just the study of plants and how people and animals use plants medic medicinally for, for various purposes. And his lab was working with groups in Mexico and Costa Rica and Venezuela and elsewhere studying the plants themselves and what kind of properties they had, medicinal properties that they had. So during my summers uh, at Cornell, I worked with him, actually worked with him throughout my, I can't remember how many years I worked with him in his lab. Um, but during the summers, I traveled with him and, and others to some of these countries. So first 
time was in Mexico, then was Costa Rica, then was Venezuela, to work with um, people who used the plants medicinally. So medicine men, medicine women. And he was teaching us, um, you know, how to collect the plants, how to, how to uh, store them properly, how to bring, um, to interview people. Um, and then the plants were brought back to the lab at Cornell and we did some experiments. So I loved, I mean, how would, how would you not? I loved the travel part of it. I yeah. hated the lab. Oh my goodness. I just, I appreciate the lab. I appreciate the, the rigor that goes into it, but personality wise, it just was not a good fit for me, but it was a good thing to, to learn. Um, it was a good thing to learn that it, it didn't suit me, but I loved it. I'm so grateful for that experience uh, with him and with his whole team there. And and I had another professor named Tom Eisner, who has sadly passed away, but he was an uh, ecologist, medical ecologist. And he taught these fascinating courses. I, I took a course with him, I think it was my senior year, maybe my junior or my senior year, where we read different papers and we talked about um, how it, it was more on the insects mm -hmm. and how the insects had these mechanisms to protect themselves. The bombardier beetle, which is this beetle that can move its abdomen, you know, 360 degrees and shoot out a chemical at 100 degrees Celsius, something like that, if I'm remembering it correctly. But he would study um, those chemicals uh, to understand what they were and the properties of them and how they could potentially be used. But it's just fascinating, you know, the, the world around you. And I think that's where I became interested in disease. You know, how do people and populations think of disease and how do they use their entire environment around them to protect themselves? So just, I mean, for me, totally fascinating. So yeah, it's, it's an area that I, I find it extremely fascinating. And I, you know, I happen to read some of your papers from the early days and we, we'll get back to that later on. We'll have some fun oh with gosh. those, but, um, but that's, you segue into epidemiology as you're saying, um, you then get, you know, head off to the field to deal with some nastier things, uh, namely H5N1. Uh, you work on your PhD, uh, H5N1, highly pathogenic avian influenza in Cambodia, evaluating poultry movement and the extent of interaction between poultry and humans. And the theme of zoonotic uh, spillover enters your, your domain now. And uh, looking, sorry, I should read your whole dissertation, but you're working in, you know, with, with hundreds of villages and, and not just veterinarians, but farmers, village chiefs. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of your introduction now to zoonotic spillover via your PhD. And also, we had some folks on uh, the show in, in the past year that have been part of sort of the Epidemic Intelligence Service from the US CDC. Um, was this a case of, hey, you know, someone called you say, Maria, we need you in Cambodia in three days because we have a problem there? Or was it, eh, uh, Cambodia, it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> do some research there. No, no, there was no phone call saying, hey, Maria, come on. Say, no, I, I mean, I was doing my PhD uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I was, you know, I was a, a, a late PhD person because I had worked for five years after my master's. And so going back, going back to do my PhD in my late 20s was quite quote unquote old for UK standards because people uh, go very quickly from university into, into PhDs. So when I got there, I was, you know, I was looking for work, um, you know, to help pay for, because I had some student loans and, and I ended up working with a professor, um, Matthias Borchert, who was working on viral hemorrhagic fevers and Marburg. And he said, I can't pay you, but I can, you can help write papers and, you know, and we can work together and you can, you can help finalize some of these analyses and work with these amazing people. And I was just happy for experience. I was just happy to do different things. Um, but in figuring out what I wanted to do for my PhD, I was interested in emergency response. I was interested in outbreak investigation. And he said, if you want to work on emergency response, you need to meet my colleague, uh, Sarenda Vong, who's based at Institute Pasteur in Cambodia. So I wrote, you know, dear Dr. Vong, I wrote him this formal email, you know, I would love to have a discussion with you to talk about, you know, the different things that we could work together on and, you know, silly student kind of thing. And he wrote back um, and he was like, it would be great to talk with you. And we just started talking and said, come on out. So I ended up, we ended up working together and I'm so grateful to him and Institute Pasteur Cambodia. 
And I started working with them on dengue, on a dengue fever project where they were setting up these long-term surveillance uh, for dengue uh, across several different provinces. And I worked with his staff um, into the field, uh, uh, Vesna Dong and uh, Sovat Li. Um, you taught me everything I know about field investigation and One Health before it was even called One Health. It was just sure. collaborative and comprehensive. And um, we developed a project looking at H5N1 in people, in poultry and in people. And at the time there were very few human cases. I think there were four, four human cases in Cambodia around the time that I went there. So in those investigations, you know, when you identify a person, um, normally you wanna identify the pathogen in the animal before it spills over into people, but that's not really how surveillance um, is set up, unfortunately. So sometimes a, a, a person, a, a patient, normally a child, um, in the early days, it was a child would end up in hospital. And then a field investigation would take place where Institute Pester, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture um, would go into a community, into a village, mm -hmm. meet with the village chief, um, explain what needed to be done. There was a retrospective poultry mortality survey. There was a human serial survey and active case finding. Um, and it was just comprehensive. It was just so interesting um, to be able to look at it from the animal point of view, the human point of view, and the environment where they come together. So we developed uh, the PhD project where I essentially worked with amazing people around the country, uh, interviewing um, backyard poultry owners, people who lived in villages to understand contact with poultry, to understand trade raising and trade of poultry. And we flagged down what we call them middlemen, uh, um, people who, mainly men, who drove motorbikes with the chickens and ducks in the back of the, we flagged them down on the side of the road and interviewed them um, because we wanted to understand the movement of birds and the potential circulation of this virus so that we could inform the ministries on where they could put limited, their limited resources to have the best surveillance possible to capture something quickly. So, I mean, I just worked with people who were hardworking, happy. Um, you know, some of my fondest memories in Cambodia were, I, I we rented cars for everybody, for, for the different teams, driving around villages in really rural areas, six different provinces across the country, and saying, okay, where's that village? And we would get direction, and be like, you see that palm tree over there, so go down there and go that way, and over there, not there, over there, over there. <laughs> and then when I would meet the teams, and we would go through the questionnaires, they were just so eager, and so oh God, it was just one of the most positive work experiences I've ever had in my life. And I, I just can't wait to go. I can't wait to go. I, I was back in Cambodia recently um, feeling like I was getting back to my roots, but I just loved it. <laughs> loved it. That's loved awesome. It. And that's awesome. Um, you then, time goes by, you now have both the leadership of the, the Emergent Diseases and Zoonosis Unit at, at the World Health Organization. You're also uh, in the role still at the Imperial College of London, doing outbreak analysis, modeling, and, and as mentioned at the beginning, although we, we the public, have, have been most familiar with you the last couple of years via the briefings on TV about COVID, um, even if COVID never existed, um, we must remember that you have been involved in a uh, sort of a storm of all sorts of other nasty stuff over the years, Zika, MERS, Ebola, Marburg. Um, and it's a silly question, but how do you decide what, what to focus on in a given day with all these nasty things out there? I, I mean, I, I take my hat off to you <laughs> that you it's have to good, deal with all good, these, but- It's a good question. I mean, uh, these are not, well, I say this now, and as we film this, you know, or, or record this, we have COVID, we have uh, Ebola. I don't work on Ebola. We have another team led by Pierre Formenti um, working on Ebola and Marburg now. My, my team is responsible for our arboviruses, Zika and chikungunya, um, pox viruses. Yep. Um, and now we have the situation with monkeypox right now. Um, high threat respiratory pathogens, MERS, which we're still having cases of. COVID-19, we deal with bacterial diseases like plague. Um, and I have a lab team that's working on rapid diagnosis. I mean, how do you choose what you focus on on a given day? It, it, it's about, I have, I, I'm working with amazing, an amazing team. Um, I, I have amazing supervisors and we work with people all over the world. 
So one of the superpowers of WHO is our convening power. Mm -hmm. We bring people together and so many different technical disciplines that are working regularly, sharing information. And, you know, I have an amazing team here at WHO, but I, I like to joke that, you know, my team is a cast of thousands and thousands of people around the world because people work with WHO to help us understand, to distill information and turn it into advice mm -hmm. and then turn that, you know, that guidance into practical policies and implementation. So the, you know, the, the knowledge into know-how and the know-how into how-to. Um, but it, it, it's a balance, right? I mean, um, before, you know, when I was, when I finished my PhD and I was doing my postdoc at Imperial College in this MRC Center for Outbreak Analysis and Modeling that Neil Ferguson was leading at the time, it has a different name now, but he's still the lead. Um, I was the epidemiologist and the in the field person working with WHO and linking WHO and, and Imperial. Basically, how statistics, mathematical modeling, and I am not a modeler. I've done some modeling, but I am not a modeler. Can can support WHO programs? You know, the programs that are aimed to have better surveillance, are aimed to prevent, detect, control these types of pathogens. And making sure that the skill sets were talking to each other, that good data from the field was feeding into those models, that the results of those models were actually linking into the policy and advising and, and, and supporting policy decisions. So, um, but when I first, and I worked on a variety of different pathogens, I had, we had the 2009 flu pandemic mm -hmm. um, that occurred then, and then there was Zika, public health emergency um, I became the MERS focal point mm -hmm. um, when we, we had several outbreaks in many different countries related to that. And yes, I mean, people know me most from the, from the COVID-19 work and the forward facing stuff where a lot of people think that that's my main job. <laughs> it's actually not. Um, I'm privileged. I'm super privileged and super grateful to have that, but that's not actually my main job. My main mm -hmm. job is to work with you know, experts and people around the world to develop the guidance, sure. you know, to turn all of that evidence into something practical to tell countries what to do, to work on the strategies. And I am so grateful for Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan. Um, you know, I would not have made it through these last two and a half out, two and a half years without those two. Um, but it's it's that role and being able to communicate that um, is challenging. Um, but we're in the connected world that we live in with, with so much access to information. It's important that, that, that we have these regular opportunities to talk about it because it's tough. It's complex. Yep. It's interesting. It's scary. It's um, we, but we still try to make sure people have knowledge for, you know, to be empowered, to do something good. So I don't know. I don't know how we choose what we do in a given day. Um, the days are long. Um, the work is not letting up, uh, but I, I guess right place, right time. But you, you know, people ask me, how did you get that job? How did you, how did you go from, you know, point A to point B to point? There's no, there was no, there was no plan to do. I mean, I, I loved epidemiology and infectious diseases. And I, oh, and I believe in the World Health Organization. I believe in the United Nations and multilateral. I mean, I've drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm in it. I believe it. Uh, but there was no direct path here. There was no no. So I was lucky. I'm very, I worked hard, but I'm very, very lucky. Um, a very supportive family. Um, and the rest is history, I guess. So they well, say. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're there doing it. And, and um, it, you are very calming in the way you have done it over the last couple of years and in a very balanced sense of the word. So I, 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 I just want to appreciate the fact that, you, <laughs> that you're there doing it for, for the rest of the public. Um, you know, on a recent show, uh, a couple months ago, we profiled um, Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikosoka, uh, who is one of the members of your SEGA, or the Scientific Advisory Group for the Origins of Novel Pathogens. And, and we had a long discussion about One Health, which is something you just uh, previously uh, mentioned. Uh, we've had people on like John and Mazette, um, Suzanne Murray from the Smithsonian. The One Health topic has been really hot uh, over the last couple of years. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the, the SAGO, if you would. And then also, I, I don't know if this is connected, but love for you to talk about it as well. I, I heard you speak recently about the uh, the Pandemic Preparedness Treaty. I don't know how connected they are, but I know you're passionate about them. So if you could if you could talk about those three and sort of link in One Health, I think that's kind of. 
I mean, it's all it's all connected. I mean, if you're working in this area of pandemic preparedness, it's 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 all connected. Um, you know, One Health is fashionable again. Uh, for those of us in this field, it never went out of fashion. It's just good that we have more attention to it right now. Um, I think you know the the idea of this comprehensive nature in which we need to study disease emergence. I mean, One Health is beyond zoonotic pathogens. It's 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 about climate change. It's about um, urbanization, you know, AMR, so many, so many different aspects. But on this particular aspect of emerging, re-emerging um, pathogens, One Health is really critical because no one works alone. Um, I was fortunate to grow up in my in, and through my career. We are always working with other disciplines. You're always working with other groups. As an epidemiologist, I would never you know, work without veterinarians or a statistician or a clinician or, cause I'm not medically trained. I think that's one of my regrets. I think I would always, I would, I would have liked to have been medically trained um, in addition to ID, infectious disease epidemiology. Mm -hmm. One Health is, is about multidisciplinary, complementarity, um, comprehensive study of, of a particular topic for me. And, th and in this case, emergence and re-emergence of these pathogens. Most of these high threat pathogens are zoonotic, which means they are circulating in animals. They may not be harmful to the animals and they move, they jump, we, we say jump uh, or, or transmit between animals and humans. And they can go vice versa. We were, we're animals too, right? So um, uh, the study of that is, needs to be comprehensive. It's not haphazard. There's a way in which it should be done where you look at particular studies that need to be done in animals, particular studies that need to be done in humans and studies at the end, what we call the animal human interface and the environment in which you share. The, so everything that I do and I have done in my career is about uh, One Health, uh, whether we called it that or not, it's all One Health. And that's why our expert networks contain people who cross so many different disciplines, are from so many different countries around the world. The SAGO is a, is a scientific advisory group that's recently been formed to study how these pathogens emerge, whether it's a known pathogen that's re-emerging or new pathogens. And um, we, have, we have incredible members in this group and they've been tasked to outline a framework to study, to, to outline a framework for study each time this spillover happens, each time there is an emergence or re-emergence. And this group, this framework will cover everything from environmental studies, studies at the animal human interface, genetic studies with molecular epidemiology, serology, um, anthropology, um, all ep and epidemiology and, and severity and all that, and all the way through biosafety, biosecurity. So looking at, because a lot of labs will be working with these, um, with these pathogens. And so there will always be the question of whether there was a breach and biosafety or biosecurity in that. And that was how some of these viruses entered into the human population because there have been lab accidents in the past. So that's what the SAGO is doing. Um, they also have the task right now of uh, evaluating um, how this pandemic began. What were the origins of SARS-CoV-2? Mm -hmm. um, they are also looking at the emergence of variants of concern and what are the studies that are needed to better understand the emergence of variants of concern. Um, and they're also looking at other pathogens. So it's not just about COVID. So we will be going to them about monkeypox, mm -hmm. having discussion about, you know, the continued spillover of monkeypox in endemic countries, because the world is paying attention right now to monkeypox because they've seen some exportations and some human to human transmission in countries that are not typically seeing that. But there's a big problem of monkeypox in endemic countries. And it's really a shame um, that we need events like this to bring attention to diseases like monkeypox, where for us, it's a priority pathogen. And we have uh, a focal point, uh, Rosamond Lewis, who's, who's been working on this. And, and there are many other people at WHO who've been working on this for years. So um, there's a lot to do in this space. Um, there's an interest in One Health, but we have to keep that interest. Um, we have to maintain that interest because there is no peacetime with pandemics, right. peacetime with epidemics, um, pandemic preparedness is a constant. And that links into this treaty or accord or whatever it's going to be called, a binding agreement to, be, to say, a contract to say, we need to be better prepared for this. So for me, it's quite visionary 
Um, you know, the, the discussions are just starting. Um, they're going to take some time to, to, to come together to, to have those discussions with member states. But for me, it's inspirational and it's an opportunity to leave something behind for mm -hmm. future generations. So it's, it's the right moment to have these discussions. Um, and I'm very hopeful that we will be able to come away with this agreement with all member states to just say never again. Absolutely. What, um, in terms of the infectious disease space and, and sort of the tools and technologies, you know, we, we, we've been focusing on, on the ones that are out there now in terms of the, the mRNA vaccines. We did a show on Corbivax and, uh, and that whole uh, process, obviously the diagnostics. Um, and then we touched on some of the sort of the next phase of stuff that may hopefully be coming, whether that's pan vaccines or the pan coronavirus or pan other types of vaccines. We dabbled a little bit in the area of molecular farming, uh, potentially, you know, how we could create low cost edible vaccines, things of this nature. What gets you excited in terms of infectious disease tools and technologies? I know you don't specifically develop them there at WHO, but, you know, if, if I came along and gave, you know, whatever, a trillion dollars tomorrow, what types of things would you be interested in investing in, in the infectious oh. disease space? Oh, it's out. such that's such a great question. Uh, <laughs> trillion dollars. I'll take a trillion dollars. Uh, see. Five trillion, whatever you need. Five, five trillion. All right, we'll <laughs> take five trillion. Um, I mean, I, technology is one thing, and, I, and to be quite frank, I don't think technology is really the problem. If we could have sort of a pan coronavirus, if we could have a pan flu virus, you know, if we could have not virus vaccine, excuse me, if we could have you know, vaccines that were highly effective, perhaps intranasal, giving a broad immune response with, you know, long lasting, uh, that would be, that would be ideal. Safe and effective, that would be uh, fantastic. And there's a lot of people that are working on that. I would also love to see rapid diagnostics um, available to people but not just that, but making sure that we have the technology systems and the surveillance systems and the reporting systems to get patients into that clinical care pathway. Um, you know, it's about the patient, it's about the person, wherever they show up, getting that, that, that accurate diagnosis and getting into that clinical care pathway um, quickly. But I would spend money on people. I would invest in communities. I would invest in finding better ways to uh, support people, listen to people, build trust, um, and, and get people the health care that they need every day. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these issues with, you know, with these emerging diseases, with pandemics, um, just highlight the inequity and the disparities that, we, that existed before the pandemic even began. Um, it exacerbates it. So if we don't actually deal with the root cause and that type of money yep. needs to not just be on the fancy shiny objects at the end, you know, or the latest shiny object really needs to be put in that investment into, into communities, into health systems, into a public health workforce, into supporting, protecting, respecting health workers uh, with contact tracers, community leaders, um, you know, and making sure the health facilities at local levels are staffed, have equipment, um, basic equipments for testing or, you know, exams, examinations. Uh, that's where I would, that's where I would put the money. It's not as sexy as a, uh, you know, a, a vaccine, which we need. I'm not trying to say we don't need that, but we also need to invest in the stuff that goes unseen that helps people every single day. And if they're, if you have healthier populations with universal health coverage, which is one of, um, you know, the priorities of the World Health Organization and of our director general, then it will make everything less bad. And we have healthy people um, contributing to healthy economies um, and we deal with people's livelihoods. So, you know, dealing with mental health issues, dealing with disabilities, dealing with underlying medical conditions, De dealing with access and equity. So for me, that trillion dollars needs to be spent there. Excellent. 
yeah, I would say that, that that leads into my next question because I, yeah, the, we, the, the social determinants of health uh, and topics of this nature have, have, have also been extremely important in, in recent months. And, you know, I was gonna, I was gonna pose to you if, you know, if, if, if we were to solve this infectious disease thing tomorrow and, and, and Dr. Gabriel just came in and was like, Maria, we, we don't need this unit anymore. You know, I, I was gonna pose, you know, so what other areas of, of biomedical, uh, uh, the whole biomedical system are you interested in uh, after infectious diseases? Obviously, have, you have a lot to do here, <laughs> but are you interested in cardiology, neurology? What other things, you know, when you when you come home and you read the newspaper or watch TV, what, what other area of the biomed, or do, are you not interested? Maybe you, know, you watch lawyer shows or something like that, but what, what other areas of, of non-infectious disease research are you interested in? Well, I mean, I, I do love, I do love science. Like I do love medicine. Um, just the mechanisms by which, you know, the pathology of things I would probably want to study. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, is there anything else other than infectious diseases out there? I, I don't know. No, I really, I really, I think you know, uh, that's a hard question for me to answer um, because I love what I do. I feel really lucky. I mean, not, not a lot of people love what they do. Not enough people love what, let's, let me rephrase, not enough people love what they do. And I love the field of work that I'm in. I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, I find it absolutely fascinating. It's, it's devastating right now to be dealing with a pandemic and we're still dealing with this pandemic as we think to the next one, we're still in the, in the middle of this one to think, to know this virus, this invisible pathogen has affected every single person on the planet, whether they've lost a loved one, they've been sick themselves, they've lost a job, their future has been altered. Um, it's, it's really quite striking to me. So the field that I love is, is really devastating. Um, but I got into this because of the spillover risk, this, this potential. Why are viruses or pathogens, you know, they don't harm the animal, but when they happen to jump species, and in this case, jump into humans, cause such devastation. Um, and this happens all the time, but it doesn't take off. You know, it doesn't take off and cause outbreaks or epidemics or pandemics. Um, and how do we how do we do better the next time? Have better surveillance the next time? So I like all areas of science. I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Um, I mean, if, if I were to do something else, it would probably not be in a, a medical field at all. I do like watching those home makeover shows, I got to say. I think those are great. So does my wife. Yeah. And the organization ones, the ones that do the, the, um, the organizations in the closets with all the rainbow colors and stuff. I'm like, wow. I mean, someone, someone, they, those two women that run, do that show, come to my house and organize my closets. That would be so fun. <laughs> all right. Well. One one last question, Brian. This, this, as I said at the beginning, I was going to loop back to um, to the beginning and just have a little fun with this one. But um, you know, um, as we're talking, as you were mentioning, it's a serious thing. We have uh, this monkeypox um, stuff happening out there. Hopefully, it does not uh, get too far. But I wanted to focus on a different type of monkey, namely the capuchin monkey. And I want to go in our our time machine back to. Silver Spring, Maryland, November 3rd, 1999 at the International Conference of Ethnomedicine and Drug Discovery where you present uh, the poster session, Fur Rubbing Behavior and the Capuchin Monkeys, uh, yeah. which you later published in the Journal of, Derm Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, 2002. And I found paper. your first paper. I love looking at people's first papers. And I found this, aside from the fact that I love natural products, uh, there, were, there was a, well, there's several fascinating things in this paper, but two of the ones that stood out to me, one, uh, the monkeys went out and they didn't, they went out to nature's pharmacopoeia and, and they didn't just pick one product. They weren't pulling penicillin off the shelf. They got, sometimes they went to the seeds, sometimes they went to the leaves, sometimes they went to the citrus fruits. But then when you came back to the lab, and I know you didn't like doing the assaying, but uh, in some of these plants, you found combinatorial bioactivities, uh, antimicrobial, antifungal, insect repellent. Uh, there was somebody that actually took one of these plants, the Piper marginatum recently, and found that, that it had larvicidal activities against this mosquito that likes to carry dengue around and, and Zika and all that stuff. Um, I'm just interested in looping back to this because I have passion for natural products, but you gotta, as you were just saying, you know, so the animals don't always get sick, right? They, they transfer it to us and so forth. I'm just wondering how much 
we're leaving behind, because you talk to people in the natural product space and they always tell you, we've only scratched the surface, despite the fact that most of our pharmaceutical industry is based on natural products from fungi mm. and plants and so forth. I think there's a lot more left out there. Do you think yeah. there's any connection potentially to whether it's pharmacognosy, even zoopharmacognosy and studying, hey, maybe the monkeys know something <laughs> that keeps them healthy or keeps them, that, that potentially we could learn once again from nature to solve some of these issues because we do need a lot more antivirals and we need the, the novel antibiotics and we don't want to always destroy the natures out there. Please take the floor at that one and run in any direction you want. I mean, oh, ab absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Uh, I, I think we have so much to learn from this planet um, and so much to learn from the animals that live on this planet, the, the plants that grow and, and how they, 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 yeah, I mean, no question in my mind, there's so much to learn out there. There's so much to study. Um, and, you know, again, one of the reasons why we have to take care of this planet um, that we share. Uh, it, it, it's a very small world. Um, for those of us that are lucky to be able to travel around and see it, um, it's a very small and interconnected world. And I think there is a lot out there in, in plants and we have so much to learn from animals. We have so much to learn from each other. The, the nagging thing in the back of my mind is, do we, do, are we doing that enough? Are we learning enough from each other? And I don't, I don't necessarily think we are. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there not to destroy in the learning and doing so, um, but to be much more conscious of, of what are the possibilities. So yeah, the, I, th I think it's a, I think it's a totally fascinating world. My goodness, that paper, that first paper was being in Costa Rica um, and on this family uh, farm where we were doing these studies was just so eye-opening to me. I mean, to be surrounded by these capuchin monkeys and there were other monkeys, I, I, I have a picture I can't find it anymore. It's, a, it's not digital. Holding a spider monkey in my hand, mm -hmm. you know, right, with his tail wrapped around my wrapped around my hand, overlooking this beautiful beach. The place we were um, sleeping um, was a, a cottage uh, that had bunk beds, and the, and you, you needed to be in your bunk bed before the the generators went out because the bugs came out, and you had to have the the, the nets down. And I remember at night, um, you know, bed would be clean, you know, and then you put the you put the, the bed net down. And then in the morning, there were all these bugs that had gotten through that kind of wiggled their way. So they didn't have any, they didn't have any wings. <laughs> the bed would be full of bugs. And then at night you would hear, you'd hear these noise and you go, what the heck is that? And they were crabs, like big red crabs that could climb the walls. Oh, nice. And then you could hear the monkeys on the roof. You could, I mean, it was just in the world we live in. I don't know. It's a long, long winded answer, but I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And I, and I appreciate that message about, uh, about understanding it all and, and us all communicating. So it's really beautiful. Uh, Maria, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating journey you've been on. And I, I just really, I wish you the best with all of this as you, as you continue uh, to deal with not just the, the current pandemic, but everything that's coming. And, and as I said earlier, I'm glad you're in this position uh, doing this and obviously with your team. Um, for, for everybody that is going to be listening to this episode across the podcast networks or, or watching on the YouTube channel. Again, you've been listening to Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, uh, Emerging Diseases and Zoonosis Unit Head and Technical Lead uh, for COVID-19 Response at the World Health Organization. Uh, Maria, I, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Obviously, thank you for everything you've been doing there at the WHO. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating journey and really wishing you the best with it all as you keep doing it. Thank you it. so much for having me. This has been really nice. Great seeing you.